Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. If I can do that, there we go. Um, so, my name is Lara Allen, and I am based in Cambridge in the UK. I am absolutely delighted to be invited to give a keynote today, but I'm just very sad that I can't be there in person. So I have myself hovering in spirit over Lake Tana. I really wish I was with you. Today, what I want to talk about is a tale of two cities, um, a very exciting emerging way of doing things that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the collaboration between Cambridge and Bahada. So I'm going to talk about ideas, institutional frameworks and methodologies, but really what that all comes down to is the people and the partnerships that make all of that possible. So, The, the topic of my talk is inclusive innovation. Who is involved in inclusive innovation and why are we obsessing about this particular approach? Well, it has to do with who we are. So I run the Centre for Global Equality and this is Cambridge's International De Development Network. What that means is that we bring together researchers, people from civil society, NGOs, consultants, people in business and people in government, we bring those people together to try to make the world a better, more equal, more equitable place. But what does that mean really? Um, about five years ago, um, those of us involved in the Centre for Global Equality got together and um, thought that we really need to work out what do we really have to offer the world? And in a sense, that came down to what does the city of Cambridge have to offer the world and the people in the city? Well, Cambridge has been sharing its ideas and um, intellectual frameworks and research with the world for a good 600 years. And the, the idea that Cambridge research and Cambridge science and technology can change the world isn't really a new one. It's been doing that for a very long time. What has happened in the last 30 years is that that knowledge has been applied to, ha, has been more applied to impact than, than was the case before. So about 30 years ago, people in the University of Cambridge and other people in the city decided that um, Cambridge needed a business school and it needed an institute, eventually an institute for manufacturing. Basically, it needed to take the research and in a sense, commercialize it. So that's, that was the, the main project. And that developed into what's now known as the Cambridge Cluster, which is a um, group, well, a lot of high tech businesses that have grown up around the university and have become enormously successful. I mean, there's some pretty effective and um, interesting stats. I um, mean, it, it is recognized as uh, one of the most successful high tech clusters in Europe. Well, I'll have to phrase the, rephrase the way I say that in a few months time. So that's nice. So what Cambridge does well is it pushes the envelope on knowledge. So it, um, it does that in research and it does that very well in commercial R&D. However, it doesn't always do, do it to make the world a better place and certainly not for everybody. So we get to this position where it's fair enough to say that m most or much leading science and frontier technology goes to making the world's wealthy more wealthy and more comfortable. That's okay, but we don't think that that should be exclusively the case. In fact, I'm not sure we do think it's okay. 
So there are a bunch of us in Cambridge who think that this inequitable distribution of intellectual resources or ideas or ways of doing things is not a good plan. We think this is leading to environmental destruction and it's not helping us make the world a fairer place. Academia, Cambridge itself and academia more broadly isn't really necessarily making the world a better place, or at least it's not trying to do that very specifically. So I think we can give ourselves two out of 10 for effort. And we really, we really could do better. Nice. So how are we going to do better? Or more specifically, in what way do we want to do better? So after lots of conversations, we've decided that our aim is to mobilize frontier science and technology to enhance the well being and economic development of half the world's population. So that's about 4 billion people in the world live on less than about $4 a day. And it's important that we do this without harming the environment or the people of the future. So our quick way of saying that is that we are interested in innovation for, with and by the rising billions. This isn't particularly new and as good academics, I think it's important that we acknowledge that we, we build these ideas on quite a long tradition of thought and of action that many, many people have been involved in. And in a sense, there are two traditions um, that lead into the way we do things. One is, and, and both of these traditions have evolved in the second half of the 20th century. One is um, the, the sector called international development, um, and very importantly and influential in the way that we do things is the critique of international development, how it's done, what it's been for, and how it can be improved. And sort of 50 years of international development action led to the United Nations pulling together eight Millennium Development Goals. And that was a number of aims um, for the betterment of the poorer half of the world's population between the, the year 2000 and the year 2015. A second tradition of thought is um, people who have been quite worried about the way in which the world is developing, um, industry, globalization, and what that's doing to the environment, how we are destroying our environmental base, um, and how we really need to change that. So, um, very important. Uh, meetings and books came out and reports. And in 1987, the Brundtland Report um, gave us this definition of sustainable development. It's development that, needs the me that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future. So all of these ideas are, are quite similar. The Millennium Development Goals led on to the Sustainable Development Goals. So the Millennium Development Goals were roundly critiqued. In some ways they did very well, in other ways there were some quite serious problems about the way in which the MDGs were put together and what they achieved. The, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals are much better um, for a number of reasons. They were participatory in the way that they were um, evolved. So there was three years of discussion and it wasn't just a bunch of people in the West or in the North um, thinking them up, but a global discussion. And the SDGs bring together the social and environmental strands that I talked about. They also take a systems view. So they recognize that health is impacted by education, which in the end makes a difference to jobs and all the different goals are related to each other. 
the goals also recognize that uh, donor funding isn't exclusively the way to go. And there's quite a sophisticated way of tracking whether the goals are being met or not. So I don't want to go into this too much, but for those of you who teach, um, I actually find two pieces of work quite helpful in explaining to people who might not necessarily um, have a background in this, uh, how to think about it. So one is the very influential paper by Rockstrom and his colleagues, um, published in Nature in 2009, which talked about nine planetary boundaries which we must not exceed if we're going to carry on living on a livable planet. And then, very nice for students, is Kate Rayworth's um, merging of the concept of environmental boundaries and social justice. Basically, she says there's a ceiling of resource use that we mustn't go beyond if the world is going to carry on being livable. But there is also um, a social foundation of unacceptable human deprivation. So we need to live, humans need to live between the, the environmental planetary boundaries and the 12 dimensions of the social foundation. Um, and there's, if you use my PowerPoint, there's a nice interactive diagram of this donut in which you can move your cursor over it and discover all the different aspects, which I found to be very useful for students. So, um, and Kate Rayworth has also managed to get someone to write, uh, make really nice videos that very quickly and easily explain what's going on. All of that's fantastic. But, neither Rockstrom and his colleagues nor Kate Rayworth explain how, how are we going to do this? And that's where we come back to a bunch of us in Cambridge who want to try and make a difference. So what we say is that we need researchers and civil society and business and government all to work together on what we're calling inclusive innovation. And that is research, and R&D post-research for the 4 billion people living on less than $4 a day. And the way in which we do this is through four Ps, programs, principles, practices, uh, practices and partnerships. And that's what I want to talk about now. So in Cambridge, in the Cambridge ecosystem, our project is to make it easy for really good scientists and technologists and social scientists to work on problems that would contribute to addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we do this in four ways. We start with a challenge, with a problem, which one might call take pull. We also start with the opportunity of new science and explore how that might make a difference. We have lots of international co-creation collaborative programs. And in the end, we bring it all together in an incubator program that we call a cultivator. A few, uh, few examples, um, just to give you a sense of what these programs might mean. So in what we call tech pull programs or challenge identification programs, we would um, ask, the people in our network and our colleagues and our friends in developing countries, what the problems are. So problems right from the ground. And then we bring those problems to various different groups of people in Cambridge. So it could be problems that are addressed in, in, in the curriculum, so in courses. Um, so we regularly bring problems to students in engineering, in um, manufacturing and computer science and a number of other um, programs. So we bring projects to students working in their courses. We also bring problems to collaborative groups of students and people in the city and researchers who want to work together beyond the curriculum in hack style or solve -a -thon style programs. We also importantly bring those questions to researchers 
and go through the long process of raising funds to do big long research projects on these problems. A program that is slightly more unusual, I mean, everybody runs challenge led programs, but one of the things that we are doing in Cambridge that is a little bit different is to start the other way. So what you might call a tech push program. Um, and that's because we are very excited by the really interesting cutting edge research that is being done in the university. And we want to investigate whether or not that research could be useful and could make a difference to the lives of people in developing countries. And we have evolved this program we call Development iTeams, which does that with teams of students. And we run this program twice a year. It's been very successful. And a number of these um, sort of opportunity seeking programs have actually developed into small social enterprise startups. And that brings us to what we call the cultivator. So this is really an incubator accelerator type thing, um, but it's neither an incubator nor an accelerator nor a catapult because all of those words have to do with being fast um, and getting out there as quickly as possible and making as much money as possible. And that's really not what we're interested. We're actually interested in longer, slower, more iterative, um, ways of doing things because we're not trying to make a high-tech startup we're trying to solve an intractable problem that hasn't been solved before and we think to get that right that takes a long time so we have about 20 um, social enterprise startups in the cultivator at any one time we largely work in a number of sectors um, water health food environment and the cross-cutting theme is work because all of this, um, what, what, one, well, it's, it's hard to say what is the biggest problem, but in the end, if we can generate a viable, economically viable um, way of doing something in country through a startup or something like that, it, it's more likely to survive in the long run. So having explained that um, we belong to a long tradition of intellectual thought and practice, of course, as academics, we don't want to entirely take what everybody says as read. We always want to push the envelope and do things a little bit differently in our own way. So there are a few orthodoxies that we push against. So one orthodox view is that technology push is the wrong place to start. If you if you start with a hammer with your technology, then everything looks like a nail. Um, and that results in redundant technologies dumped in Africa and other places like the storeroom of health equipment that nobody's using. However, we think that it doesn't matter if you start with a problem or if you start with the potential solution of a new piece of science or technology, as long as you enter the co-creation cycle and you collaborate with end users. Another orthodoxy is that the, the, the idea embodied in the term knowledge transfer. And basically this is that you do the research and then when you've done the research, you transfer that knowledge out, whether it's to industry or to other places in the world, it's do the research first and transfer your knowledge to recipients of some sort once the research is over. This really isn't going to work when you're trying to um, solve a problem that hasn't really been solved before. And we think this is because you really need to be in conversation and in dialogue with the end users or the end beneficiaries right from the beginning. So we have evolved a way of working between practitioners and researchers with ideas and innovations going in and out of the university in a helix type structure. And this way, this interactive inside outside the university 
uh, where working has is becoming very successful and we are involved in a lot of programs who are taking this approach on. The third orthodox view is something we hear quite a lot from people in the high-tech startup world and that is that poor people are not interesting from a market point of view. Our view is that people with limited expendable income do constitute a market but only if you get the value proposition exactly right, um, which is why you need to work with end users. And just to do the maths with people who care about money exclusively, um, one pound, if you sell something for one pound to three billion people, you get three billion pounds, which is exactly what um, the mobile phone industry has discovered. So back we are to our concept of inclusive innovation. And I hope what's evolved out of our conversations around orthodoxies and other ways of doing things is that the inclusive, inclusivity needs to be both inclusive in purpose and intention, who is it for, but also in approach. So if you're going to get this kind of thing right, you need to collaborate, you need to co-create with end users, and you need to make sure that end users genuinely and um, in a very real way participate in the research and the R&D that you're doing. This makes a question mark around the idea of expertise. Who is the expert? Um, I don't know. If this... And really, the inference in all of this is that end users are key experts. So you might say that the world leading material scientist in Cambridge is an expert, is a technology expert, but the woman farmer um, in Dangishta in Ethiopia, she is the expert in the problems that she faces. So our challenge has been how to bring these different kinds of experts to the table and how to make it possible for them to work together. So ultimately, this means we need partnerships. We realize that to do things effectively and efficiently and really to make a difference in the long run, we needed long-term partnerships with people in African countries who are particularly interested in inclusive innovation approach. They need to be people who want to collaborate internationally, who are prepared to experiment because we don't quite know what we're doing yet. We're working it out. We need people to co-create the way of doing things with us. We need people who are strong researchers and strong practitioners and who have both rural and urban access. So that's a big long list of needs. So we searched through our network in Cambridge and one of our member organizations is an organization called Partners for Change Ethiopia which for 30 years or 35 years has worked with a leading national NGO in Ethiopia called JECTO, which is particularly good at building community institutions and capacity building with communities. So Partners for Change introduced us to Mr. Mulugeta and Mr. Ediglin at JECTO and things just got better from there onwards. I should say that at this time, a number of our member organizations were introducing us to partners in a number of other countries, Kenya, Ghana, India, South Africa. But the partnership with Ethiopia just took off and it is our most successful collaboration to date. So Jekto said, you know, we, we, have, we have a place in Bahada, which is this beautiful city and a beautiful lake, um, but we also have um, a very good university. And as it happened, I don't know, luck was with me, it turns out that the university that Jekto introduced us to um, has one of the strongest or possibly the strongest tradition of science and technology in Ethiopia with a long history and that that history is deeply embedded in the relationship with communities and with societies. So 
in October 2017, I made my first visit. And I'll probably say that that visit has significantly changed the course of my life or the course of my working life since then. I, I was trying to work out how many times I've been back to Ethiopia since then. It's about, it's two to three um, times a year since then, which is why I'm getting withdrawal symptoms from not actually being able to come and visit now. So one of the people that was extremely influential in making these partnerships success, success and really enabling the beginning of this very successful conversation was the scientific director at the time, Dr. Negus. Thank you. And Dr. Negus introduced me to an academic, a hydrologist, who was very helpful, um, answered all my emails, and had a real can-do enthusiastic attitude. I didn't realize that this friend and colleague would suddenly rise to be the next scientific director, which is quite helpful. So Dr. Se um, Seifu, thank you also. So October 2017, first visit. Within six months, um, we were able to build a um, to host a international partnership building workshop between the University and Bahadai, uh, University of Cambridge and Bahadai University. Um, not everybody who, who came managed to make it into the picture, but it was a very successful and interesting partnership building workshop, which has led to a lot of collaborations since then. Another workshop that happened about a year later was the Bahadai Digital Infrastructure Initiative, um, asking what can ICT for D do for specifically for infrastructure in Bahadar. Um, and I should note, in order to save time, I have um, for each project I've acknowledged who the BDU team is for that project. Um, I hope I've got everybody's names in there. But these conferences eventually need to lead to actual collaborative research. And the first project that managed to get funded was the Millets and Nutritional Enhancement Traits for Iron project, which we just call Milneti. Um, and this is a collaboration between uh, Cambridge, Bahada, in Ethiopia, a team in the Gambia and a team in India all looking at nutrition and how um, some populations are very iron deficient. As it happens, Ethiopia is less iron deficient than the other collaborative countries in the partnership because of the way in which th there is more iron in TEF and because of the way TEF is um, uh, cooked. And that means that iron is released and becomes bioavailable. So the team in Ethiopia is specifically looking at bioavailability of iron in TEF and in millets and it, a little bit in maize as well. What's important about the way that we're doing things here is that particularly Dr. Hirut, who's leading the project with um, Dr. Minale, um, Dr. Herod has always been very good at working with communities and the idea that she might learn from community members is not new to Dr. Herod and uh, the Ethiopia team is therefore helping teams in other countries learn how to do that kind of work really effectively. Another very successful um, project that has just been funded is, is one that I'm very excited about because it really embodies the way in which our sort of the way in which we really want to do this kind of research. Because the 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 question that the research addresses came from Ethiopia. It actually came out of Dr. Seifu's work with communities when I mean, he's been working with communities and um, irrigation systems. And through a very successful um, piece of research about smallholder farmer irrigation, eventually um, one of the answers that came up is that it would be very nice to 
use solar powered pumps to irrigate small vegetable plots. Um, and the communities really like the pumps, but they're just way too expensive. So we took the challenge, how can we drop the price on um, solar driven irrigation systems for Ethiopian farmers? And we're doing this by uh, shaping the system to exactly what farmers need and making it really very efficient with the electronics. And we hope in the long term, using a funky new technology, um, a new kind of solar panel that will be light, portable, cheap, and we hope in the end possible to make in Ethiopia. So it's a long term dream, but it's not out of the question. What's important about both of these two projects, Milneti and Absisvi, is that um, one of the partners in the projects in collaboration with CGE is Jecto. So CGE and Jecto are building what we call an innovation communities program in which we are working with two communities in um, communities on the Zege Peninsula that grows coffee and uh, farming communities in Dangishta, Kerele, near Dangila, who um, grow millets and maize and teff. And the idea is that Jecto will build the capacity of these communities to um, run, evolve and run innovations on their own, and also to give feedback to researchers about the new ideas that we bring in to the communities. So if we come along with a fancy solar powered irrigation pump, which researchers will make to the best of researchers ability. We will then bring that to um, farmers in the community and ask them to test the pump and give feedback and make suggestions about how it can be improved. We're very excited about the possibility of doing that. Another example that I just wanted to highlight is, is a smaller project, but a very exciting one, which is doing the same thing in terms of co-creating with communities. So Waterscope is one of CGE's most successful startups in our cultivator. And Waterscope has evolved a way of testing water quickly and easily. And we hope in the long run, make it possible for communities to test their own water. Um, Waterscope's been working on their new instrument for quite a few years. And now we've got to the point where it is possible to actually test it with communities. And right now, in these weeks, um, a team from the Blue Nile Water Institute, led by Dr. Menale and with Mrs. Lydia, are testing and giving feedback to the Waterscope system. And then the team from the Blue Nile Institute will work with communities, people in health clinics, um, to see whether they can actually use the system and the feedback that is given will change the system and make it more usable um, so that in the end we can make a difference. So where does all of this, I've spoken very much about Cambridge's concerns, um, but in the conversation, and, and I've talked to look quite a lot about research and the success that we've managed to evolve with a number of collaborative research proposals. But in the end, what we really want to do is work with people in Bahada to create an inclusive innovation ecosystem in Bahada. So we had a, a student who came and did, did some work and lots of interviews with local people. Um, and at that point in time, it was just as Dr. Seifu was taking over as scientific director and a new business incubation and techno entrepreneurship center was just being established. But what Dr. Seifu said is, you know, um, one of the problems we have is that our staff and our students have nowhere to make new innovative stuff. They have plenty of ideas, but they don't really have a workshop or somewhere where they can experiment on these ideas. And that was the beginning of what has become BIT Makerspace. And we managed to get some funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to establish the Makerspace. So this is the makerspace before pictures. 
Dr. Sophie managed to allocate some space to us. I believe it's just about to move somewhere more glamorous, but this was very exciting a year ago. And we started this project. For me, the BIT Makerspace project has been one of the most interesting and exciting projects that I've done. It's really been very rewarding. So we bought equipment and shipped it out and the Makerspace team started running a number of really interesting and exciting workshops. The first was using the 3D printers that we had sent out to make more 3D 3D printers and I just want to say how impressed I am by, by um, Henoch who has been running these workshops and giving loads of time and energy to everybody who's been interested in taking part in them and without, without Henoch these the ability to use 3D printers to build 3D printers just wouldn't be possible. Another workshop that was hosted was the um, Ethiopian branch of the African Biomaker Challenge, which has been run from Cambridge. And there were a number of intra-African knowledge exchange programs. So we're working closely with Nairobi Makerspace in Kenya. Um, um, uh, Sonet attended the Makerspace, African Makerspace um, gathering in Ghana. And there is presently a PPE collaboration going on with Makerspace in Malawi. So I want to end my presentation with some of the really uh, exciting problem uh, projects that have been based in the Makerspace over the last six months. So the last six months have not been happy six months for the world, but it's been so impressive to see what people in Makerspace have been doing to respond to COVID-19. And I want to use these last projects to return back to the main components of the inclusive innovation approach, which is innovation for, with and by the rising billions. So here are some examples of innovation for that have been based in the makerspace. So innovation four is solutions evolved outside of the local context, but specifically with the end users in mind. So some of the most useful things that have been done by teams in Cambridge and elsewhere is to evolve open source designs that can be made anywhere else in the world. Because that is when, when, when there's a problem with supply chains and you can't order what you need, if there's a uh, possibility of making it yourself, then you're independent and you have sort of sovereign control over your ability to respond to the pandemic. And the Makerspace team led by Henoch has, has taken um, PPE equipment designs, um, face masks and face shields and adapted them but have taken these designs that have been certified in places like the UK and is presently making them. The innovation with is of course, for me, the most exciting of the three initiatives. And this is solutions created between actors in the local context and beyond the local context. And the most exciting project that's going on at the moment is a collaboration between a team of engineers in Cambridge and a team of engineers based in Makerspace at BIT to evolve a oxygen concentrator. It's a new design based on some modeling that was done in Cambridge, but the teams in Ethiopia and, Kenyan are, uh, Ethiopia and Cambridge are working to check whether this modeling is actually useful and interesting and to des design a concentrator. So watch the space to see something really exciting coming out of this in the future. And then the third thing is because the makerspace was there and there was a workshop for clever and motivated people um, in Bahadar to work in, 
BIT has invented uh, very, very quickly and very efficiently and effectively a number of different um, responses to, to the pandemic. And that's got to be very rewarding. Um, so I'm completely delighted by that. I'm really looking forward to being able to come back to Bahada and to collaborate in more research, more R&D and more maker projects in the future. Thanks for listening. If anybody has any questions, I think we'll be able to find a way of discussing this um, digitally over 6,000 miles. Thank you very much.